Sounds good. Can you can everybody hear me? Oh, yes. All right. Welcome everybody, glad to, to be with you all this evening. Uh, I'm excited about uh, going through the book of Revelation. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot there, and it's, a, it's a, a scary thing for some people, but uh, as we go through this, I think some of the fear will, some at least, of the fear will go away. Let's begin with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word, and for the gift of uh, you're revealing yourself to us for the gift of prophecy. Um, ask, we ask you to uh, send forth your Holy Spirit upon all of us here this evening to open our minds to, uh, to your word and your, your teaching, your gift, and to help us to grow in our understanding and our love of, of your word and of your revelation of uh, who we are uh, and what is going on, where, what, what our faith is about, and where you call us to. We ask the Blessed Mother to pray for us and to watch over. She who, who gave us the word of life, the word of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to jump right into it. The full title of this book is A Revelation from Jesus Christ. We usually go by the shorthand, the book of Revelation. So what is it? <laughs> right? If you, I found some really interesting pictures, you know, because the book of, of Revelation talks about the four horsemen, right? Uh, there's war, hunger, uh, uh, plague and, and death. It talks about there's the, uh, the earthly temple and the heavenly temple. It talks about the two witnesses and it describes them at one point as being two olive trees and at one point they, they're killed and then they, they lay in the streets uh, and then they come back to life and they're caught up into heaven. Just some strange imagery and symbolism here. There's the, uh, the great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. There's the beast that 
is kind of a, an, uh, a mirror image of the dragon with its seven heads and ten horns as well, terrifying. And there's a second beast that uh, induces the whole world to worship the first beast. Um, there's falling stars, there's all kinds of incredible imagery. There is the, uh, the whore of Babylon, the harlot of Babylon, uh, that uh, induces the world to, to chase after her and her lewdness and to drink the cup of, of, uh, of her lewdness to the dregs there. There's the famous number 666. That's my parking space yesterday. That's your parking space? <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> That's my number, not where the parking lot is. Well, it, when, when we get to talking about the, the number, that I think this, that'll be interesting as well. There's, there's, uh, there's some other background to that that we may not always be aware of, but it's, it's usually considered to be the, the sign of the beast. All right, and then this is, there's, there's a figure, the, the son of man, who he's described with a, a white linen robe with a gold sash with five flames come from his, from his uh, eyes, with a, you know, white hair, with his voice like the sound of many waters, with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, with his, whole, his face shining brighter than the sun, in his right hand holding seven stars, <laughs> and walking among the seven lampstands. You can see the seer John there just being overwhelmed at the, uh, the vision that he is encountering here. It talks about the seven seals, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And at, towards the end there, there's the, the great and beautiful vision of the heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, the streets of gold, the river of life running through the middle of it, the trees that give their leaves and fruit for, for the nations, for healing and for, for nourishment. There's the throne of God and the Lamb uh, there at the center. The, the gates that are made of a single large pearl, the foundation of uh, 12 different, 12 stones representing the 12 apostles. It's just an incredible vision. St. Ephraim the Syrian, he's one of the uh, greatest poets, Christian poets, uh, that the church has produced. Uh, he was a deacon, and he said, Lord, who can grasp all the wealth of just one of your words? What we understand is much less than we leave behind, like thirsty people who drink from a fountain. For your word, Lord, has many shades of meaning, just as those who study it have many different points of view. The Lord has colored his word with many hues, so that each person who studies it can see in it what he loves. He has hidden many treasures in his word, so that each of us is enriched as we meditate on it. So the word revelation, the Greek, which is the original language which revelation was written in, is apocalypsis. We get the English word apocalypse from there, which literally means an, an unveiling. A means the, the, the un or the non, apocalypse, veiling. So it's, it's a, a revealing, uh, an unveiling. Uh, and we'll, we'll see here in one of the verses shortly on, you know, uh, the messages to reveal to John and to the, all the churches, to all of us, what is to, to come. This genre of literature dates back to at least 200 BC, before Christ. The author of Revelation calls it prophecy. He says, blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. So it's a prophetic, apocalyptic writing in the form of a letter to specific Christian communities. can be summarized as an unveiling about four things. The condition of the churches of Asia Minor, God's sovereignty and Christ's lordship over history, the conflict and tribulation before Christ's return, what we have to go through to get there. Christ himself described it as the cross. 
and a preview in general terms of how God will fulfill his promises, defeat evil, save his people, all the while summoning us to an appropriate response. So we'll see the, uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. Those are kind of scary plagues of different kinds, but they're all ways of God saying, wake up, come, come return, come back to the Lord. You know, it's, they're, they're ways for God to summon us to an appropriate response. And those things are happening every day in our world. When was this book written, right? We don't know exactly for sure. Scholars think maybe in the mid to late 60s. That would have been before the destruction of the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed about 70 AD. And Revelation talks quite a bit about the temple. It goes into descriptions about it and talks about it as though it's still there. And so it would make sense if it was written before the destruction of the temple, maybe during the reign of Nero. Because Revelation refers to the prosperity of the city of Laodicea in chapter 3. And Laodicea suffered an earthquake in 60. So maybe it's before the earthquake, or right around the time of that, that earthquake. Some think that maybe it was written in the mid-90s during the reign of the, the emperor Domitian, 81 to 96. And the reason for that is because in chapter 6, it says, do not damage the olive oil or the wine. Maybe that's an allusion to an edict of Domitian about vineyards in Asia that was decreed in, 19, or in, in the year 92. Okay? So we don't really, we look, we look for internal clues like, like those, those two things but it's kind of hard to know for certain. So we're pretty sure it was written in the first century. Okay, whether it's in the 60s or the 90s, somewhere around there. Pretty early. Who is the author, right? He names himself four times. He says the revelation, the very first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show him, being Christ, to show to his servants what must soon take place and he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So he describes himself, first of all, as a servant. Then he says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, just giving his name again. I, John, your brother. And then he describes himself as a co-partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance. Was on the island called Patmos. We'll see where that is, just off the coast of, of Turkey, near Greece. On account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he was prophesying, preaching the word of God. You know, he was suffering. He was advocating for the kingdom. He was being patient and waiting for, for God's triumph. And then lastly, he says, I, John, am he. And he who heard and saw these things. That's right at the end of the whole book. All right? Some argue that this is not the Apostle John who wrote the Gospels and maybe the first, maybe the three letters of John. Because the author's Greek is obviously secondhand with Aramaic as his mother tongue. Very different from the Greek of the Gospel of John or the first letter of John, which is a pretty high, much more higher caliber of Greek. Okay, the, the caliber of the Greek of Revelation is, is like a, it's not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's much simpler. The author in the Gospel and in the letters never names himself. In the Gospel, he just, he's referred to as the beloved disciple. So it's, it would seem different than why and all of a sudden in Revelation is he has no problem with calling himself John. He never calls himself an apostle in the book of Revelation, even though at, at the end, in chapter 21, he, he writes about the wall of the heavenly city of Jerusalem having 12 foundations and on them the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He never says, and my name was one of them. You know? 
So there's, there's some, some indications that say maybe this is a different person. Also, this is very interesting. In the third century AD, the Bishop of Alexandria, Dionysius, said that there were two tombs in his time bearing the name of John and venerated by the church of Ephesus. If you, if you go to Ephesus in present-day Turkey, the ruins of, of Ephesus at least, there is the foundation is all that's, that's left, a part of a wall of a basilica that is that was known to be the Basilica of, of St. John. And there's still today, I visited there back when I was a, a seminarian, there's, there's uh, I think it's empty, but there's a, a tombstone there uh, with John's, the name of John on it. This particular bishop says that way back when there were actually two tombs there, both with the name John. So maybe one was the apostle, one was the seer of Revelation. So those are kind of speculations. We know that he calls himself a Christian prophet, that he names himself as John, that his native language seems to be Hebrew or probably Aramaic. He has a great familiarity with the Old Testament because, and so that supports the impression that he was a Jewish Christian. Right? And uh, there are some similarities to the Gospel and the letters of John, which make it seem that at the very least he was familiar with those. He had at least read them, if not written them himself. Okay? So that's about as far as we can go with who was this guy. <laughs> Let's go do a quick little overview of the book here before we get into it. So there are, depending on how you think about a quote or an allusion, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 quotes or allusions to the Old Testament in these 22 chapters of Revelation, more than any other New Testament book. Most of them come from Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, those prophets, or from the Psalms. The risen Jesus commands John to write what he sees regarding two periods. And let me just pause there for, for one quick moment. The risen Jesus speaks m m a great deal in this book. And it's kind of amazing to think about that. This, next to the Gospels, the book of Revelation has more direct quotes of Jesus than any other book of the New Testament. In a, in a, in a very real sense, we could put it on the level of a Gospel. It's like a fifth gospel. The one kind of important difference is in the gospels, it's the historical Jesus, you know, in, during his earthly life who's being quoted. In the book of Revelation, it's the risen Jesus who's speaking and being quoted. That's kind of a powerful thing to think about. When we, when we, when we read the risen, the book of Revelation, we're hearing the risen Jesus speak to us. So the risen Jesus is commanding John to write about uh, what is happening. So the first three chapters are the seven messages to seven churches. And then what will happen afterwards? Jesus says, come up here and I will show you what must happen afterward. Come up here. There's a little door that opens in heaven and he goes up. He's caught up in spirit. After the seven messages to the seven churches in the first three chapters, there are three series of sevens. There's the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. Um, it's kind of showing all the different trials and tribulations, calamities that we go through in this fallen world. There would have been a fourth series of seven. At one point he talks about the seven thunders, but then these were sealed up. And the way to think about that is they were rescinded as an act of mercy. So there would have been seven other kind of trials, tribulations, difficulties that we, that we endure in this life. But God's mercy intervenes and says, no, uh, hold those off. 
why is that? You know, is that, is that because the church is is advocating, is is calling upon the mercy of God, or just God's just God's mercy in and of itself? We don't know. The plot doesn't really it doesn't seem to go chronologically. <laughs> it's more like a path circling up a mountain. Because there's different you're looking down at the same spot from different heights, so to speak. So for example, uh, in each of the series of those seven seals, trumpets, bowls, the seventh seal, for example, signals the end of human history, the seventh trumpet, the seventh bowl, but then it goes right back to you know, the, the, first, the, the, the next series of seven. So it's kind of like you got into the end of history, oh wait a minute, let's look at this other perspective, oh, there's the end of history, wait a minute, let's look at this other perspective, the same thing. I don't know if that completely makes sense, but hopefully as we go through it, we'll see this again. Revelation uses about 70 similes. A simile compares two unlike things using like or as, whereas a metaphor attributes the qualities of one thing to another without using like or as. So we will see a lot of, you know, as fire, as snow, as uh, etc. And we tend to be a little more liber literal than the ancients, you know. They, they liked these similes. Let's, to what can I compare the kingdom of God? To what can I compare this, this vision that I had? This, this, this reality that I, that I know and believe in my heart? How can I describe that? Okay? There's a lot of numbers in the book of Revelation. All right? This is really kind of fascinating, I think. Seven and ten are symbols of completion, right? The weak. Fingers, toes, symbols of completion. The, uh, the week, you know, the, the, the word seven in, in Hebrew uh, also means, uh, an, it, it's an oath, right? The, uh, on the seventh day, God took an oath that he would, um, he would rest and he, he, and, uh, and he would bless all of his creation. So the number seven is... Is a, is a number of completion. God completed creation. Three and a half is half of seven, so it's a number of incompleteness. Four refers to the world, the four winds, the four points of the compass. Twelve is the number of the people of God, whether that's Old Testament tribes, New Testament apostles, and a couple times 24 is used, which refers to God's people under both covenants, right? covering everything there, the whole view of history, all right? There's diverse images of Jesus that we will encounter here. The glorious Son of Man and ruler of the nations. The slaughtered lamb. That's, a very, that's probably the most popular image in the book of Revelation. And then uh, the divine warrior leading... <laughs> It's, a, it's funny because it says he, this divine warrior, when, when we get to that point in Revelation, you know, he, he rides forth at the head of an innumerable army, but he conquers the, all the foes through the, from the, through the breath of his mouth. <laughs> so he's got this huge army, which never fights because he does all the fighting himself in an instant. <laughs> so I don't know if that's just like to make us feel better. <laughs> But all you need is Jesus, the divine warrior. All right. <clears throat> Again, just this, this, this gives you an, an, an idea of how tightly written and compact and kind of, you know, how much effort the John put into this, writing this book. Lord God Almighty, that phrase is used seven times. One who sits on the throne is used seven times. Christ is used seven times. Spirit is used 14 times, which is twice seven. Jesus is used 14 times. Seven of those times he's described as the witness. The witness. Erkomai, the Greek word for coming, is used seven times. 
Prophecy is used seven times. Lamb is used 28 times. Four times seven. You know, the whole world times the number of completeness. One who lives forever and ever, four times. There are four references to the seven spirits. There's four references to the seven churches. The phrase peoples, tribes, languages, and nations is used seven times. The number 12 is used 12 times in describing the heavenly Jerusalem. And then, this is interesting, the author avoids multiples of seven when he references Satan eight times, the dragon 13 times, the beast 38 times, Babylon six times, and the devil five times. So he's very careful how he constructs this. And he makes changes here and there because he's trying to communicate something. Just, just by the very way that the, the book is, is composed, the, the structure of it, and the, the language that is used. An extraordinarily complex literary composition. One of the most unified works in the New Testament. All right, so the prologue, first eight verses, has an epistolary opening. It's, it's like he's writing a letter. And the epilogue has an epistolary conclusion. So it does have the beginning and the ending of a letter, even though everything else doesn't seem to be as literary in, in that sense. The whole book is a single visionary experience. He talks about being in spirit, which is interesting because we'll get into this more later on, but he doesn't use the, uh, the article in the Greek. He doesn't say in the spirit. He says in spirit. And that marks four stages of his vision. So in chapter 1, verse 10, it introduces the seven letters to the seven churches. At the beginning of chapter 4, it introduces his being caught up into heaven. When Jesus says, come up here, and I'll show you what must, what, what must come. And then in chapter 17, it's used when he goes to describe the earthly city, the harlot. Okay, And then in chapter 21, when he goes to experience the heavenly city, the heavenly city of Jerusalem. So those four times is when he references being in spirit. And they kind of give a structure to the, whole, to the whole work as well. There's the seven letters, there's the, hef, you know, the heavenly vision, there's the earthly city, and the heavenly city. The seven seals, trumpets, and bowls are marked by a progressive literary device that borrows language from the Sinai theophany in the book of Exodus chapter 19. Sinai theophany. Theophany means a, a, a revelation of God. When God revealed himself, on Mount Sinai to Moses and, and to the, the children of Israel. Okay, so in Exodus it says, on the morning of the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. All right, thunders, lightnings, cloud, trumpet blast. All right, in chapter 4 verse 5, Revelation says, and from the throne issue flashes of lightning and voices and peals of thunder. So it's drawing on that language from Exodus. But then it builds in chapter 8, verse 5. There were peals of thunder, voices, flashes of lightning. That's all what was in verse chapter 4, verse 5. And an earthquake is added. <laughs> and then in chapter 11, verse 19, the same thing. Flashes of lightning, voices, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and great hail <laughs> is added. And then, in chapter 16, flashes of lightning, voices, thunders, a great earthquake happened such as, and describes the greatness of that earthquake, and great hail like, describing the great hail. So it doesn't add another thing, but it, it adds description to the things that are there. So each one of those uh, three progressions from chapter four just kind of grows the, uh, the, the, the drama 
gets gets deeper and deeper. Okay, the, moving towards the climax of the heavenly city of Jerusalem. All right, a quick little overview of the whole outline of the book. You got the prologue. You got the vision of Christ and the churches and the seven messages to the churches in the first three chapters there. And and then the inaugural vision of, of heaven when he gets up, called up to heaven, leading to the three series of sevens, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls. Um, and there's intercalations. I'll talk about that in just a moment. So the seven seals, it's, you know, there's four seals, kind of one after the other, and then there's a fifth seal, and a sixth seal, and then there's kind of like this big, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 another thing starts to take place. He starts to describe this whole other thing. It's like he forgot about the seventh seal, and then he comes back to the seventh seal. All right? And the same thing happens with the seven trumpets. There's four of the trumpets are just boom, 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 right in a row. There's a little interlude, and then a, the fifth trumpet, a little interlude, and then the sixth trumpet, and then a big interlude before we get to the seventh trumpet. Okay? And then there's this three chapters, basically five, five, four chapters, rather, that kind of talk about the story of God's people in conflict with evil. Uh, that's the, the, where the red dragon comes in and the woman clothed with the sun and, and it, it's talking about God's people. It's talking about us, the church. And then it goes back to the seven bowls. Now there, there's no interlude. It's, it's four with a little break and then the last three right in a row. And then it gets to the earthly city, Babylon, the harlot, the transition from there to the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, the bride, and then it closes with the epilogue. So that's kind of the, uh, the structure of the book. All right? Any questions about that so far? I think we are about ready <laughs> to start. All right? Are you sure? <laughs> All right, here we go. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's kind of the title of the book, right? The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants what must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, as much as he saw. Right? It means there's more. This is just what John saw. There's a lot more out there, a lot more to God and Christ and the Spirit. Blessed is he who reads, and blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy, and who keep what is written therein, for the time is near. We'll come back to that. What does that mean? The time is near. Everybody gets scared about that. So there's the title, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the divine origin of its content, which God gave. All right? God gave this to, to Jesus Christ to show. There's the way that it was transmitted. All right? Uh, Christ makes it known by sending his angel to John. It was transmitted through the mediation of an angel. And then there's the blessing that awaits all who read, hear, and keep it. All right? So I'm reading this. You're listening to it. If we keep it, we're blessed. <laughs> That's pretty darn nice. There's a blessing for us who are just studying this word. All right? The word revelation, of, as we said, apocalypsis, occurs only here in this book. It's 17 times used elsewhere in the New Testament. The line of revelation goes God, Jesus Christ, his angel, his servant, the prophet, and then those who hear the words of the prophecy. So one, two, three, four, five kind of groups or people involved there. What must soon take place, all right? 
That contrasts with the Old Testament, where the, in the book of Daniel, it says there, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, Revelation. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, the later days, not in the near time, but this is still a far ways off. All right? The book of Daniel talks about what's a long ways off yet. And then in chapter 12, Daniel, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. All right? Shut up the words and seal the book. The time is not yet. No one will understand this until the time. All right? Because you're talking about mysteries that are far off. And then Revelation, at the very end, the angel says to John, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. All right, what does that mean? It means Christ has been revealed. Christ has been born. He's lived, he's suffered, he died, he has risen. And so all time after Christ is near. Is soon. We are living in the end times. We've been living in the end times for 2,022 years, approximately. <laughs> All right. So it doesn't mean that, gosh, in in a few years or tomorrow, the the, the second coming is going to happen. I mean, if you think about it in, the, in terms of the whole course of history, right? How many millions of years has do they think the Earth has been here? And and for 2,000 years, that's pretty near. We haven't, I don't know how much longer it'll be, but I mean, I don't think, I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> we're, all, we're supposed to always be ready. But it's not, it's, he's not trying to say, you know, be nervous. He just says be ready. <laughs> this is the first of seven Beatitudes in the book. Each beatitude focuses on the conduct characterizing a faithful disciple awaiting Jesus' glorious return. So the first beatitude is about uh, reading, hearing, and keeping the words. The keeping the words of this prophecy. All right? So that was the, the first one that we just saw. The second uh, beatitude is, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Yes, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, in chapter 14. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who keeps vigil and guards his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame, chapter 16. The garments, of course, throughout the New Testament, the, you know, the whole Bible, but especially the New Testament, the garment is always a reference to our our, our baptism, our, our faith. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, they they went naked. <laughs> they, they, they started to clothe themselves, but they were naked. They had lost the Spirit. And with Christ, we are now clothed with the Spirit. We put on Christ, St. Paul says. Um, the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. That's chapter 19. Blessed are those invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, with a slight uh, modification, that's what we say at every Eucharist, right before communion. Blessed are those uh, called to the supper of the Lamb. Which, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. There it just... In the Mass, we just say this, the Supper of the Lamb. So it's, this is a foretaste of what we will experience in full in heaven. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. We'll talk about that, all those things. It's kind of exciting to, to, to look forward to that. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. If you participate in the first resurrection, you're guaranteed to get to the second one. 
<laughs> Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. It's kind of a re reiteration of the first one, or at least part of the first one. And then lastly, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city, into the heavenly city. All right? So seven Beatitudes. That's it, number seven again. All right. Verse four, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. And this is that epistolary greeting. Grace, well, the whole thing, but grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us. It's a present tense there, who is loving us. He's loving us right now. To him who loves us and has loosed us from our sins in his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion into the ages of ages. Amen. There's the epistolary greeting. And then behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and whoever pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail over him. That can mean several things, right? You can wail in grief and terror and sadness. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word Almighty there, the Greek is panto krator. Panto, all. Krator, judge. The all judge, the Almighty. The Hebrew behind that would be, uh, I'm not supposed to pronounce the divine name, but Yahweh Sabaoth. Adonai Sabaoth. So there were at least three other churches in Asia at this time, besides the seven that are being written to here. It was Troas, Colossae, and Hierapolis. All right? They were, so ten churches in Asia at the very least at, the, at this time. He writes to seven because he uses seven as a number of completeness, right? So in writing to seven churches, he's writing to the whole church. That's the idea. This is for us as well, the whole church. An Aramaic translation of Deuteronomy 32, verse 39 reads, See now that I am, see now that I am he who is and who was, and I am he who will be. All right? Just incidentally, Zeus was acclaimed in the same way. Was, is, and will be. But, of course, the Almighty, the, the Lord, is greater than Zeus. <coughs> Zeus is nothing in relationship to this God. So that was another allusion to the Old Testament there. And this is a Trinitarian greeting, right? Grace to you and peace from, there's God the Father, him who uh, is, was, and is to come. There's the Father. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. Again, seven is a number of completeness. So when they say seven spirits, they mean the Holy Spirit, the perfect Spirit of God. Right? So that's the Holy Spirit. When it says the seven spirits before his throne. And then from Jesus Christ. God the Son. And Jesus is given four titles there. He's Christ, the anointed Messiah. He's the, the witness, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Four titles there. It's just, just these few verses. It's like a whole catechism, right? And it's the only doxology in the New Testament that's addressed solely to Jesus. Uh, to him, there in verse 6. To him be glory and dominion into the ages of ages. To him, to Jesus, be glory and dominion forever and ever.
Okay? In the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah says, I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps which are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then he said to me, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. So, you know, seven, 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 this number of completeness, right? It's the seven lamps, the seven lips, the seven spirits, and, and that's a, a reference to the Spirit of God being the Holy Spirit, right? So John in Revelation is drawing from Zechariah here. Again, the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So in the Old Testament, it talked about the Son of Man coming with the clouds, on the clouds. That was the sign of, of his divinity. And verse 7 in Revelation, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Again, Zechariah, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of compassion and supplication, so that when they look on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Right, when they look on him whom they have pierced. And Revelation up here in verse 7 says, And whoever pierced him, every eye will see him, and whoever pierced him, and every time we sin, right, metaphorically we, we pierce him, and we need to weep for our sins. Uh, again, well, this is in the Gospel of Matthew, well, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will wail, right? Uh, it's almost like a direct quote from the Gospel. There in verse 7, all the tribes of the earth will wail. Okay, and Jesus in the gospel also talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Genesis even talks about all the tribes of the earth. By you, all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. That was God in relationship speaking about Abraham. All right? So that phrase, all the tribes of the earth, all the tribes of the earth. It's John is drawing on all that resonance from the Old Testament there. All right? Verse 9. How are we doing here? We're doing all right. I, John, your brother and co-partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance in Jesus. So he's a co-partaker in the tribulation. So we suffer because of our... Uh, faith in the Word of God, our, 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 our faith in Christ. There's a, there's a tribulation that we go through. But we also, are co he's a co-partaker in the kingdom. By our baptism, we already are citizens of the kingdom. Now, we're citizens of the kingdom. We're just not there yet. And the patient endurance kind of gives that, that uh, understanding. We're not fully in the kingdom yet. We have to patiently endure the tribulation in order to get there. So this, I, John, your brother and co-partaker, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Um, all of us could say this, or need, should be able to say the same thing on some, some level. Is the tribulation that I endure because of my dedication to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice like a trumpet saying, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamon and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. All right. So John was in spirit. He was out of the body on some level. 
on the Lord's day. He was in exile on the Lord's day, it's Sunday. Uh, maybe he wasn't able to celebrate the Eucharist with the community because he's in exile. And the Lord had mercy upon him and caught him up in spirit to experience the word of God apart from the community. And then to take this back to the community when he is able to. All right. So there is a, a, a map of the, the, that's Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. You know, here's Jerusalem, the Holy Land, Nazareth, uh, Greece over there. So you can see um, right up there is the island of Patmos, right off the coast from, from Turkey. And then there's the seven churches. Ephesus, it's almost like a, like a, a circle there, like a, like a writer's loop. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. That's, how he, that's the order in which he named them. Okay? And this is the vision <laughs> that John has. Uh, and that's just an artist's rendition of it, right? Can you imagine the real thing? It's kind of hard to imagine. Awesome. And I turn to see the voice. It's interesting, the phrase there, to see the voice. <laughs> Don't you listen to a voice? Oh, he's, he turns to see the voice. This, this voice that is, is the word. He's going to see the word which is just as strange a phrase, right? I'm gonna see the word. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and on turning, I saw seven gold lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. So the lampstands, the gold lampstands, represent the seven churches. I don't think John necessarily had this in mind, but, but maybe there was a bit of a connection here where and we'll see this, this will be repeated when we go through the letters, but the, the lampstand represents the church. Think about in, in our, our churches, right? We have the, the sanctuary lamp downstairs by the tabernacle. That's a, it's a sign of Christ's presence with us, right? And so are these signs of Christ's presence. And we'll see that brought out in, when we get into the letters. Where at one point, the risen Christ will say, you know, unless you change your ways, I'm going to come and take your take your lamp away from you. Take basically my presence away from you. In the midst of the lamp stands, one like a son of man. So Christ is in our midst. He's clothed with a long robe and girded round the breast with a golden sash. And his head and hair were white as wool. As snow, there's two similes. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, as in a, as in a furnace refined. And his voice was like the voice of many waters. You know, if you're hanging out at a waterfall, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, it's powerful. It's like, that's how John heard this voice. The power behind many waters. Water can bring life and death. It can sweep away. It can bring great refreshment and nourishment. It can, it has, it's very powerful. 16, and he held in his right hand seven stars. And from his mouth a sharp two-edged sword went out. And his face was like, was like the sun shining in its strength. An incredible description there of, of what he saw. All right. In the book of wisdom, for on his long robe, the whole, this is the high priest is being described in wisdom here, the, the whole world was depicted and the glories of the ancestors were engraved on the four rows of stones, which was, you know, he wore on his, his breast here, depicting the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And your majesty was on the diadem upon his head, on, his, on the, 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 the forehead of the, the high priest, he wore the divine name, right? He never pronounced it, 
but he had it engraved there. So it's kind of like he's, he's a high priest. John is describing Christ as the great high priest. In the book of Daniel, again, I looked, uh, thrones were placed, and one that was ancient of days took his seat. His raiment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. So it's interesting, some of the language that's used to describe God the Father, who is the Ancient of Days here, is now being used to describe Jesus. Right? John is, over and over again, he, he communicates to us that this is a divine figure. Jesus is divine. He's equal to the Father. Again in Daniel, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen. Linen was, all, all the priestly garments were always made out of linen in the ancient world. Because linen was, was, was grown from the ground. A priest never wore wool, because wool was an excretion from an animal. It's like the leftovers. But wool, or linen, was from flax. And it was grown from the ground. It was given by God whose loins were girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the voice of his speech like the voice of a multitude. So Revelation is drawing deeply from the Old Testament, especially from the book of Daniel. In the book of Sirach, he does not realize that the eyes of the Lord are 10,000 times brighter than the sun. <laughs> they look upon all the ways of men and perceive even the hidden places. So this idea of many eyes, or bright eyes, or flaming eyes, it, 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 it's showing that nothing is hidden, right? His eyes penetrate any darkness, every darkness. Isaiah, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. So the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth is the word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword that splits between bone and marrow. With the breath of his lips he slays the wicked. His word overcomes the evil. Verse 17, right? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as one dead. So, you know, let's say this was the Apostle John, or even if it was the seer John, who may very well have known the earthly Jesus, right? But let's say it was the Apostle John, who lived with him for three years, probably knew him more than that, longer than that, who at the Last Supper reclined on the, on the breast of Jesus, you know, the intimacy, who called himself the Beloved, and so, you know, when the risen Jesus appears to him, you can think he's like, ah, oh, he's running up and like, you know, give him a big hug, you know, pal, let's talk about this. No, he falls at his feet as one dead. There's the, the honor, the reverence is incredible here. And he laid his right upon me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive into the ages of ages, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now, write what you see, both what things are and what is certain to be with these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We'll see over and over again in multiple places in the book of Revelation, that stars are, uh, are, are, are angels. The stars are representatives, uh, uh, like symbolic of the angels. All right. So we'll finish this little exegesis of this, of this passage, and then we'll have to, to call it for the evening. And when I heard from Daniel, when I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. All, right. All the strength goes out. Matthew, uh, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. These lampstands are supposed to be giving light. The churches are supposed to be a light to all in the world. 
Oops. Yeah. So just just real well, why don't we why don't we pause there? We can wrap this up with questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, the que the question I did have was a lot of the letters in the Old Testament are to the people of this or the people of that, or in some instances addressed to a particular person in a church somewhere. All seven of these are to the angel in charge of the church. Is that a metaphor for the priest or cleric who was in charge of the church? Or That's a good question. So, you know, the, the angel of, of, the, of the church of Laodicea or Thyatira, yeah, on the one hand, that, that could be a reference to like a presiding bishop mm -hmm. of that church, you know? That would make some sense. Uh, it could also be a, a, a more literal reference to like every church having an angel, like, kind of like we have guardian angels, and every, every church having an angel that's kind of watches over it, that, that supports it, protects it, etc. It's kind of like in the Old Testament, where in the, uh, in the book of Daniel as well, there's one of the angels comes to Daniel, like prays and fasts for like three weeks, and then this angel comes to him and says, you know, uh, basically describes Michael as being the the, prince, the angel prince who's in charge of, of Israel, and, and there's d different nations have different angels that are kind of with them or in charge of them. And I, my guess is that uh, John is drawing on that Old Testament background to say, as the the nation of Israel had its guardian in Michael. Each of the churches has their, their guardian as well. Now that's not to exclude that it can also be a reference to the bishop or the presiding cleric. Because I think as the, the quote from St. Ephraim said at the beginning, there's, there's layers, there's multiple levels of meaning here. Good question. Anyone else? Yes, so, Phrase to me like when someone's pregnant. When someone is praying. Or praying. In there. I, I don't think it's a, just a reference to praying. I think it's he was in spirit in the sense that, you know, like St. Paul talks about being in the flesh versus in the spirit. I think like this is a moment where it's a it's a consecrated time and he's out of the body. Like St. Paul says, you know, I know a man, whether in the in the body or outside of the body. I don't know, God knows, but he was caught up to the third heaven and shown things that no one can speak about. And I think that's what's going on with John here, that he was out of the body. He was in spirit on, on, in some, uh, what exactly that, that means, I don't, I don't know. But he was, it was not a, an earthly experience. It was a, a divine revelation. It was a heavenly experience. So it's in spirit in that regard kind of an ecstatic experience, a prophetic experience. Anyone else? Well, let's just close with a glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll see, there's a lot to go here yet, 22 chapters all together. <laughs> so pray that uh, in the next seven classes I can make good progress. Thanks. <laughs>